All right, thank you everybody for coming to this week's edition of Contributor Experience. Uh, we do have a good amount on the agenda today. Today is a automation and people meeting. Um, for those who don't know, every other week we try to stick to just people processes, things like contributor guide and mentoring and things like that because automation and workflow can definitely take over a meeting uh, and the decision making around that. So that's what we are doing today actually. Uh, it will be a mixed meeting and I am putting the notes in the chat right now. Please add yourself to that. All right, and then any new contributors on the line? Nope, doesn't look like it. Lucas, actually, do you want to introduce yourself for the folks who may not know who you are on the call? Yeah, hello. So it's my first meeting. Uh, I am the guy out from CNCF who is developing DevStats uh, dashboards for the Kubernetes. And actually, that's all. <laughs> I'm working on this at the moment. So if anybody wants some new dashboard or maybe have some feedback about the existing ones, feel free free to go to CNCF dashboards on GitHub and create issue. I will address any feedback as soon as possible. That's all. Awesome. Thanks, Lucas, for again, for all your help with them stats. It's been greatly appreciated. And I know several uh, special interest groups are actually using some of the things like time metrics to uh, help them with uh, SLA creation and things like that. So greatly appreciated. Uh, All right. great, great to hear that. Thanks. Yes, definitely. Uh, and then, uh, George, do, you, we, do we need anything for community meeting this week? Do we need hosts, uh, graph of the week, anything like that? Uh, no, we're all set other than graph of the week. I didn't see anybody fill in. Give me one second. Okay, no worries. If not, we can figure that out at the end of the call. Yeah, I can ping Josh after. Currently, we have, yeah, it's blank. We okay. have ev everything but graph of the week is set for tomorrow. Awesome. All right, so we'll work on that today. All right, well, our next major agenda item, we actually have Joe on the line. Thanks, Joe, for joining us today. Uh, Joe did put in the community site cap uh, for those who don't know what a cap is. It's the community, it, excuse me, Kubernetes enhancement proposal uh, and the links are in the chat, uh, excuse me, in the uh, agenda for the assigning approver and reviewer and also Joe added some things to the proposal uh, itself recently. Um, I did uh, read that as, uh, as well today, Joe, so I am a little bit uh, up to date, but do you want to kick things off with the discussion? Yeah, so wait, I mean, Joe, so sorry. Go ahead, George. Uh, before you start, I just sent out another ping to Sig Docs, and it looks like Joseph's yeah. here. So hopefully, we'll get a few more of them to come in. Come in. No, that, that's great. I, okay. I, I first wanted to, you know, with the cap process, I think the stuff is still new. We're still refining it. It's not a done deal, um, et cetera, et cetera. The idea there is that we can, you know, a lot of times when people are putting design docs or something in there, the there's like you know 12 different discussions going on at once and you end up with like a 300 message uh pr and the latest state of what's been decided you have to like it, it you know it takes you hours to figure out what's up with a particular thing one of the goals out of the cap process is you know if you can agree on something check it in and then so the the proposal itself is not you know approved until it moves into the implementable phase right so so pretty much everything um everything that happens up until you sort of flip that status bit is still very much provisional. You can change it like, it, you know, it's not totally agreed upon. And so there's a final sort of, you know, call for action before we, we move it into the implementable phase. So, so nothing here until we actually do that, you know, is, is, is final and in stone or even afterwards, it's nothing's ever in stone, right? It's just code. <laughs> so, um, so just like, sort of, how do we actually add to the proposal? Do I mean just like any time any time we can add to the proposal? Yeah, I think okay. um, you know, definitely after it moves into the implementable phase, the bar is higher because you know that's sort of lessons learned from the implementation. And and you know, I would expect that you wouldn't, you know, if you make any like sort of like major changes, like let's throw this away and do something else instead, and maybe a new cap is in order to actually discuss that. Um, but uh, but yeah, hopefully so. 
So the ideal is to, to structure the conversation, have clear lines of sort of who's, who's on, the, on the line for improving it, who's in, uh, approving it, who's involved, and try and get a more efficient decision-making process so we don't sit around staring at each other for months, which is, is so easy to do. <laughs> um, Agreed. So, uh, so there's, two, there's two PRs. The first PR is to, is to have you, Paris, since you're, you're a lead on, on ContribX, and I think that's probably the right place for this stuff to be to be group at the end of the day, you're the one on the decision in terms of, you know, where and how. Oh, I'm on hotel Wi-Fi, let me off my video. But, you know, uh, it, you know, you, you would make the final call on, on this stuff. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, there's a set of reviewers of, of folks that we expect to be, you know, involved through the sort of the, the, um, the, 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 the process so that they're up to speed and, you know, they're involved with it versus, you know, somebody swooping in at the last minute to say, hey, don't, no, don't do that. So trying to get some of those people identified now so that we can, uh, we can have some consistency as we go through this decision making process. Um, so that's the first PR. And, um, uh, you know, we can, we can add more reviewers there later or and change that stuff up, but I just wanted to get, get something in there. And then I also added SIG docs as a, as a, uh, uh, as a, uh, involved SIG or what, what is the, the nomenclature there, but like as a, as a, you know, impacted SIG, because, you know, obviously they have, uh, some interest in this. Um, and so at least in sort of scoping it out, uh, so want to make sure that, that they're in the loop on that. So I have several questions um, <laughs> specifically around the proposal itself. Should we just start there? Yeah, well, I just want to separate out sort of the metadata around sort of how what's the decision making process versus okay. sort of the content. And that's why I split those into two separate PRs so that we could have sort of separable conversations on those. Okay. And for just caps in the future, even outside of uh, this one, is that sort of the, the process in itself is that we should do two PRs on this listing, the reviewer, or should it just ultimately go into one? Sorry, Matthew. Um, I think in general, like err on the side of more PRs, right? So okay. this is kind of like, it's kind of like a, a feature gate type of thing where it's like you can do a bunch of small features that add up to something bigger and then you have a whole gate that actually gates the whole thing. So that status field in the metadata is kind of the, the feature gate. And so, so that means that, that the, the real decision you know, happens when you actually flip that status. Everything up until then is really about sort of structuring the conversation. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so I'll just I'll just shoot off some of them. Um, so it looks like one of the questions uh, in tow here is what the domain would be ultimately. Would it be uh, community dot Kubernetes? Would it be contributor dot Kubernetes? Um, so this to me indicates that you're favoring a completely different site, meaning off of kubernetes.io slash like something, um, or would this be running on the same tool chain as the current Kubernetes site? Yeah, so, um, so the proposal there in that second PR is to have a completely separate site. Okay. And, you know, and there's a bunch of reasons in the last section there. And the, the structure of the URL is really driven by that. Um, our, our tool chain is not set up such that we can have, you know, multiple sites hosted at the same, uh, at the same domain. Just that, that's just not how Netlify works. Okay. Uh, and so, um, so if we were going to, if the workflow said that we went, you know, that everything went through the, the Kubernetes website repo, then it would be under Kubernetes, you know, www.kubernetes.io. Um, if we want to have the workflow stay in the community repo, then it would be a completely separate site with its own, uh, with a different host name. Okay. Does anybody have any comp? Joe, go ahead. Unmute on the side. Yeah. Um, I, I thought the, the, why the workflow was uh, very rational about, you know, what the constraints are within the docs workflow today. And I'm just one of the maintainers there. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily speaking for any consensus view, but I, I think all those problems are things that we should try to surmount and not have yet another site, especially when the start of the problem definition is that there's too many places to find information as it is today. So I, I would really prefer if we can to figure out how to solve the problems for the workflow into uh, the docs repo and build it into the same site. 
Um, some tidbits on the back end that may not be terribly obvious from outside the docs community is we're about to change our uh, tool chain fairly significantly migrating to Hugo after the 110 release. We haven't set a firm date on that, but we've agreed that that's definitely a course that we want to take in order to improve our own workflow tool chain, primarily around localization and translation. Um, but that's, that's one aspect that I noticed in the original proposal that Joe set up that is possibly of interest. The other is that with the addition of the Prow automation plugins, there's no reason that we couldn't have a subtree of the repository completely available to a whole different set of approvers and have that have its own workflow mechanism as a part of that process so that we could get, add the relevant folks from community in there. You could just approve what you want and add in there. There's going to be a similar need for that from uh, the blog that's going in. The, the CNCF blog is migrated into Kubernetes.io. Um, and it's going to need its own workflow, I fully expect, not be bound to the same documentation style standards that we put onto the regular internal documentation. So I think there's already a, a place for that to happen, uh, and it's going to need to happen. It just needs to do the work to make that happen. Um, the last part was uh, there seemed to be, and I may have misread the spec, uh, misunderstanding that the doc site was uh, branched and locked and that everybody saw just a constantly locked site. And that's not the case for docs. It's an evergreen site. And we do merges to master, they get updated immediately in the live site. So that also aligns very consistently with what I think the intent is based on my reading of the proposal for the community site. So I think it would work well from just a general construct. At least that's not a barrier that I perceive in there. There are probably other things that I'm missing. I haven't had a chance, honestly, to review in great depth the proposal. Um, but I think the things that Joe was calling out are all things that we can overcome and achieve while keeping it in the same site. And I would argue that it's a much more effective use of our time because human resources are the, the most constrained resource we have to do that in a singular site rather than splitting it up and, and possibly becoming multiple sites that you know then only partially get updated as they go. Question in the chat was what exactly is the doc site that is the repo that's Kubernetes slash website? Um, Technically, the docs team yeah. owns Kubernetes.io, uh, well, Linux Foundation. Um, yep. Your question, so let me, let me just repeat back something that you said, just so I get it. So um, what you're saying is if we did a, for instance, a contributor site, and it was Kubernetes.io slash contributor, we would be able to have ultimate authority over what's getting pushed, when it's getting pushed, how it's getting pushed, and that we would not need a docs team on that review or approval chain. Would that right. be that's true not, or false? That's not how it currently works within Kuber, the, the repo, but the tool chain support us setting up an approvers file for a directory where we could set, say you, Joe Beta, George, whoever, right? as approvers and then as you add the LGTM and approve comments to the pull requests, those would be acted on as though they had full approval to be merged in just based on how Prow works. So the fact that we've adopted that tool chain gives us a lot more flexibility for having different sets of approvers and reviewers at any subtree level of a repository. And then George, you have a comment? Yeah, so when I asked Zach about this, he said that that was not the plan which is why I'm confused now. Well, like I said, I'm only one voice, uh, yeah. not necessarily all of docs, right? But uh, I, I think it's worthy uh, because I think, uh, at least I would argue that it, it's more beneficial for us to keep these together and fix the workflow constraints um, th to allow you guys to do what you need to do to not have the explosion of multiple sites because I agree with the fundamental problem that there are too many issues, uh, too many places right now where things get hidden, uh, like design docs are currently one of the things I keep getting bugaboos about. Hey, this isn't documented. Well, it's in a design doc. You know, I'll see that constantly come up in documentaries. I think this is only going to exacerbate that particular problem. Joe, did you have anything to add or anything to yeah. say? I mean, this, these are interesting options. I mean, last time we talked to the docs folks, the idea around sort of changing up the workflow such that, you know, folks in the community could make changes to the website without somebody from SIG docs as an approver, that was not something that was on the table. So that's definitely a, a new option here. Um, I think the discussion around Hugo or, or Jekyll or, or what have you, I think is, is completely parallel. 
Um, the, the, the tool change that you use to generate the site is, I think, a, a separate issue from sort of the workflow around approval and such. Um, so I think, you know, you know, getting hung up on Hugo or not Hugo is, is somewhat of a red herring in my mind um, and, and something that we want to that we want to avoid. Um, if we did go through, and this is this is something that I think we have to sort of think about the social implications about, and 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 um, right now, so like like in the fullness of time, ideally, what we would want is we would want everything in the community repo today: the list of SIGs, the caps, the design, all stuff that be visible and searchable on on some public facing website. Um, as we go ahead and do that, though, if it's all in the docs repo, then essentially what we're saying is that, you know, over time, we deprecate the community repo and the website repo essentially takes over that role, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I think that there's, you know, there, there's, there's definitely some implications in terms of putting some of the core parts of our sort of community governance into something, into a repo called website. And, and and I, you know, and in terms of, you know, the discussion around sort of multiple sites and bringing this stuff together, I think the, uh, the issue here really is just the smattering of markdown that we have spread across a ton of different repos and providing a way for, for that stuff to come together. And so, you know, if we did go through and build out a community site that was separate from the main site, you know, it wouldn't be perfect. We wouldn't be down to one single site, but it would be a, an improvement here. Um, and then the other parallel that I want to say is that we have plenty of sites that are dynamic tools that are also hosted on Kubernetes.io. Um, and, um, and because they're dynamic, there's no sort of call to try and sort of work these into the architecture of the main site. So you mentioned Prow. There's, you know, there's Prow itself, Prow.Kubernetes.io. Why is that not, you know, Kubernetes.io slash Prow? Right. I, I think there's a question of like, like, you know, there's there's different websites that we have for different purposes. I think the only difference here is that these are both relatively static sites that are about documentation, but they're documentation for different purposes for different audiences. And so uh, so I, I think that that there's a certain amount of like, well, both of these things are, you know, content, largely content sites. So therefore, they should be the same thing. Uh, and that's something that I think is. Uh, uh, is is a bit of an arbitrary distinction, um, and so I'm seeing in the chat, Joe. You, you said a couple of things here that we do quite a bit of importing from other repos on an inconsistent basis now. So I, I address that in the in the in the design doc. I think that's you know not being able to preview what the thing looks like. You know, having you know the the, the tooling that's been built there so far has been relatively brittle. Um, that's tooling that doesn't necessarily end with with user. Um, uh, a user end value. Um, API documentation is a key example. Um, so API documentation is a very, uh, you know, are, are you, is that an example of the, of the importing process that you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. But is that, is that the API documentation is automatically generated. This is not something that's part of a human workflow. Um, and, and I think we do have a problem right now where right now, if I, you know, the API documentation is generated from the types.go, the comments in types.go, if I make a, a, a fix to the comments in type.go, you know, seeing that show up on the website can take, you know, a month, right? And so I think having a, a, a very long feedback loop there, which obviously would not be as long as, as any other process that we'd come, back, come up with, um, having a very long feedback loop there in some ways discourages people from actually making those fixes because they don't get that sort of dopamine hit of like, look, I did something, right? It's like, look, I did something and like a month from now it may show up. So, so I think that's an extreme example of, of, of where latency really impacts uh, productivity in this area. All right. Um, does anybody have any strong opinions on this matter? George. Yeah, I would just like to make it so that we don't have to go through and edit all the other pages, like in the community repo. Like when I was doing this imported thing, I had to go back and add stubs. And all of a sudden I had to pass a bunch of docs tests that were totally foreign to me and I had no idea. All I want to do is write markdown and commit. Like if we yeah. can make it, you know what I'm I, saying? Like, I really like Joe's idea of eventually just getting rid of the community repo 
I mean, I, I mean, not, obviously not getting rid of it in its entirety, but having very limited information that points to this site. Um, I think that's really important. I, I think just from a workflow perspective, I think like stuff like design documents and stuff like that, putting that on a website would be kind of odd before they're ready. Um, I think there's certain elements within the Kubernetes repo that, uh, from Joe's point, a cultural change doing that's going to just be it's going to hurt developers' heads. Um, but yeah, a lot of the information, you know, what you're saying, Paris, needs to be up on the website. I think we need to go through and identify what should be website, what should be uh, community repo. And maybe community repo is the wrong name, but we maybe we move it to design docs, design repo, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, or there just could be a, a stage of design docs where they get published to the site. I mean. You know, obviously, we wouldn't necessarily publish, you know, design docs that are completely, you know, just starting or incomplete or what have you. But, I, I'd, I'd actually, I'd, I'd disagree with that. I think, you know, when I said the, the community repo would disappear, what I mean is that, is that all the information in the community repo would, you know, we, we, have a, we have a fork in the road here. It's like, do, you know, do we take the information in the community repo and we host it at something like community.kubernetes.io, right? And essentially create a site like that. Or do we take everything in the community repo and we host it in, you know, kubernetes.io slash community? Uh, or do we not, <laughs> right? Which is, a, you know, the, the null hypothesis there. And, you know, um, and when I say get rid of the community repo, if we want to join it in with the main doc site, and we don't want to go through a brittle import process, then essentially we take everything in the community repo, all those documentations, and we'd have to move those to the website repo. So we would essentially fold the community repo into the website repo, um, which I think that's a cultural change. Now, if we do a separate site, what we can do is we can make the community repo become you know, the source of truth for community.kubernetes.io and keep, it, keep that particular repo relatively targeted. All right, so George is going to be leading this project for us. Um, George, do you feel like it's a safe assessment to say, uh, check with docs about this, so uh, the, the workflow stuff that Joe's talking about, and then um, possibly get started with like a tiger team and then I, keep going? So I don't know, like, do we have consensus? Because I'm not. I don't feel like we do. Like, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced, like when everyone say we have too much stuff everywhere, I would argue we have nothing anywhere, right? I would argue that we have too like much stuff. We have stuff all the wrong stuff in all the wrong places. No, I'm oh, saying sorry, when, sorry. When, when, when I Google, when I Google, I just right now just Googled for the contributor guy, just as an example. I get the broken import, which is fine. We have to fix that or whatever. And then I get the GitHub thing itself. That's why everyone's passing around blah slash master slash blob. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why, what's the problem with that being community.kates.io slash contributors slash guy? So you're like, are they even the, are they even the same audience is what I'm saying, right? I, I mean, my gut, I, I gotta be honest here. My gut is that these audiences are different and, you know, we're, we're predicating this on tooling and agreement around owners and prow that, isn't there and we've seen conflicting things and in, in my mind the benefit of, of having this thing be kubernetes.io slash community versus community you know or community.kubernetes.io I think from a from a user point of view it's 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 not a big deal. From a tooling point of view I think the tooling around trying to make a big mono repo for the for one website versus having more targeted repos uh, I think the the human investment in the overhead in my is less having a separate repo. It's essentially plus Netlify. There's no custom. He's cutting out. Yeah, hotel Wi-Fi. But yeah, yeah I, so this is Matt. I'll jump in. Sorry, hotel right Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. I, I've built a bunch of these websites and things like this over time. And Joe does hit on an interesting point here, right? They're they're two totally different audiences. Docs are for people who are end users of Kubernetes, you know, and right. about 1% of the 1% of people who use Kubernetes contribute to the community. And so for, it's for this large audience who wants to pick it up and do something useful with it, whether they're operating it or applications in it. But if you're in the community and then you want to contribute, that's a 
much smaller subset with a very specific task. But also, where do you create the web for that? Uh, actually having one big directory that has all of this versus smaller subsites, it's going to limit how you can do the UX, the kind of tools you can build things with, how you structure it. Uh, it does create some, some differences there. I mean, looking at like Node.js's site right now, they have docs and how to contribute on the same site. Um, it's very similar to like what we have is kubernetes.io slash community. Um, and I think that their site's pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, that's obviously my opinion. Yeah. Um, and here's, sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's, go ahead. Uh, so here's what I go back to. Um, helping a brand new contributor uh, over the last couple of days getting the CLA worked out, right? Every time the CLA is busted, they have no idea that we have documentation on, really good documentation, on how to fix the CLA, fix their GitHub user, and amend it. And I assume that they're going to Google and Googling, you know, Kubernetes CLA. Now, maybe we're not, but we need to figure out how to, I think what we're trying to do is do two things, improve the experience of our developers and our users and make it easier to get docs out to them. But I think to make it easier to get docs out to them, we have to figure out how they're looking for the docs and what the best way to get the docs to them is. So this is kind of what I go back to. Yeah, so, well, so from, I I, I'll go ahead, whoever. I was just gonna mention like there, there's how how people will find and consume the documentation and there's also how the documentation is organized on the back end as far as those who want to contribute and edit the documentation and i think the the the, the stronger opinion that i have on it is um having all of this documentation all in a repository called website would be confusing for somebody to go and find as far as like, where do I go to edit this backend information? Because I know a lot of people, even on the consuming side, look for it in GitHub. Even if you don't use a user facing site, a lot of people will just go and look on GitHub for where, where the information is. If they're already contributing and using GitHub as a tool, they'll go and do that as opposed to go to the user facing site to try and find it. So I think there's both sides of the discussion are important, both the figuring out how people, how we can best get the information in front of the people who are consuming it and make it discoverable. Um, and the people who want to contribute to the documentation and edit the documentation and add to it, make sure that they can easily find and organize the information that they want to get out to people. Yeah. Just, just as a data point, if you do CLA Kubernetes, it takes you to the direct GitHub page. But I think the point about having this as a site is like it's just a raw markdown page, right? And for the CLA, that makes sense. But if you wanted to do something like show me all the caps across the board that are currently open, right? That's kind of a developer thing, but raw markdown wouldn't make sense. Stuff like that. All right, so it sounds like we have no consensus on whether or not we should have this as a separate site or under the website. Quinn, did you say, did you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just still a little bit, um, I'm, I'm just still a little bit confused on what a website or even, or, or part of a website or a separate website. I'm sort of ambivalent on that. Um, but why do we need that specifically added um, when a contributor is someone who is already going to have to deal with GitHub, is already going to be on GitHub, and Jesus Christ, my coworkers are loud, I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, that's basically my question. Why do we need to put this separately on our website if most of the people who are looking for this information are already pretty familiar with GitHub or will need to be shortly? Um, as a award-winning open source project, we're the only ones that do not have contributor information on a site somewhere. Um, like we have stuff on community right now, but it doesn't necessarily even render on mobile. 
Um, I think the experience for visibility is lacking, like mentor programs and things like that. I really would rather not link to a GitHub. Um, and it just helps when we have, you know, like, like what Joe said, like a contributor.cates.io site so that we could link to Twitter and like just have this portal for people to go. I mean, that's, that's my two cents. Joe or George, do you want to weigh in on that? Ability to embed a video. There's actually an entire blog post that someone did on how Kubernetes doesn't have like a nice developer portal. I did not mean to use the word portal. Let's not go there, but he makes a lot of good arguments and I'm trying to find it. Yeah. So, so from my point of view, I'm, I'm looking at, um, I like, like pile of markdown and GitHub works up to a certain point. Um, the problem, there's a couple of problems that we have right now in Kubernetes, and these are really separable issues. Uh, the, the first one is that the, the markdown is split across a bunch of repos, and so it's not very discoverable. Uh, and so there is no information architecture across this stuff. So I think that's a problem. Number two is that the browsing experience for GitHub markdown and like things like a table of contents, metadata, searching, sorting, those things, we start cleaning up a, a bigger set of documentation uh, is going to be problematic, right? We already see this with the fact that we have a pile of, of design proposals that are various levels of out of date. There's no ordering. There's no structure to those things. It's very difficult to actually derive real data out of that pile of design proposals unless somebody points you at a specific one. Um, so some of that is the cap process to try and bring some structure to this stuff. One of the things that I, I you know, that influenced me for the cap process was looking at the, the Python pep process. And one of the things for me that really works for the Python pep process is the fact that they have an index listing all the peps, their current state, where they're at, right? And so I'd like to build something that's inspired by that, that, that really provides an approachable way to get to this stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's I think the argument for bringing this to a real website is just to make this stuff more accessible and to make it searchable because honestly like like Google does not like to index markdown files in github for whatever reason Yeah, definitely true. Definitely been my experience Yeah So sorry, I'm sorry. So, so, so my take on it is can we do a thin static site on top of the the markdown that we have in github, right? I don't want to do something super heavy here you know, now like, so like we have like the, the doc site as it exists today, not, you know, not talking about the future stuff, which is relatively heavyweight in terms of editorial process and, and for a good reason, right? I mean, there's, there's reasons why, why we're, we're taking, you know, that very seriously. There's a pile of markdown, which is like a freaking free for all where nobody can find anything and it isn't indexed. Can we do something in the for community facing stuff? And that's really that's really the argument here. Yeah, mostly I wanted nice, just nice URLs, and it's like, okay, can we slap Hugo on this and generate something in 15 minutes? Like I didn't, it wasn't clear to me until I saw the docs document that they were planning on redoing the website, which, you know, I didn't find out about it until our face to face, right? Where I was like, what is what does the website have to do? You know, I was thinking this would be more like a convenience for us because I'm always forgetting git.cates.io or whatever it's supposed to be. You know, it's like, can't we just slap some simple CSS that makes it obvious that you're not on the user end docs, right? It would be like skin different or it's like, you know, when you go to MSDN, right? Like the, the documentation for Outlook is different from like how to write your own Outlook plugin, I guess is the example I want to use. Cool. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Thanks for going into that. Just, you know, it, it's nice to have that as a background. So I, I can also maybe throw in one more thought on this. And that is, if you look at some of the popular open source projects that are rather simple with very few committers or contributors to them, that's when you'll find the contributing files in Markdown in their projects. Once you get to projects that are more complicated where they have lots of people being involved in contributing and you scale out contributors, um, because a lot of projects, you look at some of the most pro popular open source projects, don't have that many contributors to them. It's mostly consumers. And so they, it, it's very easy to onboard contributors there in common workflows and to do a little handholding. But when you get as many contributors as we do, sometimes it just takes more. And that's where the kind of contributor sites and community sites come into play. And I'm kind of noticing that trend 
among the different projects. It's scaling out people rather than, and contributors rather than the popularity of the project. All right, I'd like to time box this in for more for less than four minutes. Um, so let's try to wrap this one up because we do have some other stuff to get to on the agenda. Um, is there anyone that's completely objecting with the idea of a new site that's not necessarily Joe Heck? <laughs> and if you have private uh, or we would like to share that anonymously I'm on Slack as well. Um, I really want to move forward with this. Um, I want to keep going here. So our next step I think is to talk about actual development. Um, Joe, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, so first of all, I, I do value Joe Heck's input into this and all the folks in SIGDOC. So like, you know, I think you know, there's, there's definitely a fine line to walk here and I appreciate the concerns there. Um, I'm happy to start prototyping this stuff just so that people can get a feel and some sort of concrete ideas around this stuff with the understanding that, you know, if we look at this and we can, you know, we can, we can decide to sort of, you know, pull the plug on it and go a different direction if the, the amount of tooling, the amount of TLC that's going to be required gets out of control. Because I think that's the, the biggest concern is the amount of investment to bring up a new site. Um, I, I think the example in my mind is we have the automation of generating the SIG list out of SIGs.yaml right now. That has not been a huge burden. And it's been a huge plus on the community site in terms of creating a consistent view of what our SIGs are. Um, so I think, you know, my mind, this is just a continuation of that type of thing. Um, but, I, but I'm definitely sympathetic to, to the experiences from the SIG Docs folks. Plus one to SIG Docs. I am a huge SIG Docs cheerleader. Joe, did you, I, I saw you turned on your video. Did you have anything that you wanted to, or Joe Hack, I'm sorry. Joe Hack, did you have anything that you wanted to wrap with? Yeah, yeah. I just wasn't necessarily even agree with having I, I didn't uh, disagree that a separate site would be valuable. I am far more interested in making the content available, indexable, discoverable. However, about that, I'm behind. I just throwing out the possible concerns worthy of discussion. Fair, and I think I used harsh language with that, and I apologize. That was that was my bad. Um, I did not mean it necessarily in a negative light. Just wanted to see if other people had any other strong objections against. Um, all right, so that wraps that, um, and let's move on to the next agenda item. Uh, Joe, thanks for joining. If you need to drop, that's totally cool. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, all right, so next on the agenda is automation stuff. Uh, I, Christoph, I know I have you on the line. Um, we do have some things that you had mentioned. Um, and pinged us in GitHub about, it looks like uh, for 1.10 cycle, need to verify a script, uh, test to confirm that new vendor dependencies have acceptable open source licenses. Do you wanna talk about that uh, briefly? Uh, yeah, I can quickly. Um, it, it was just discovered that there were some uh, dependencies that were imported into core in particular, but we don't really have any monitoring around the organization as far as importing dependencies that have a license that is just not compatible with the Apache license that the rest of the um, Kubernetes source code is licensed under. Um, the process right now for dependencies and dependency licenses is basically Tim Hawken. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, that, you know, it, ha, this is something that could be offloaded to a bot. I don't know if this is necessarily at this point in March, like I pinged it back in January. I don't know if this point it's something that's by, like a stepping up Bible for the 110 cycle because we're nearing the end in a couple weeks. But maybe for the 111 cycle, that's something we want to consider is um, uh, a way to uh, verify through automation, uh, be able to kind of scan our dependencies and scan the license files, make sure the license files are up to date and that they use like a whitelisted set of licenses that we know has been vetted by, by legal and are okay for import to the project. 
So this is Matt. I'm going to jump on two things on that real quick. One is the software to build such a bot totally exists already and is open source. Second, I stumbled across a SaaS service that does this recently. I saw it on somebody's GitHub page where it had, you know, like passing build and all those other normal things you saw. And another one that was for a thing and it was a bot that did the license checking as a service and would look over dependencies. I didn't check and go down the go rabbit hole if I could handle that. But I know at least the tooling exists and there is a SaaS. Matt, can you link that in the doc? I want to comment you in. Find uh, like finding the SaaS and putting it in. I'm searching for it now and, and we'll see if I can find it again. All right. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Thanks, Matt. All right. So we'll keep lines open there. And then the next issue, or actually, did anybody else have any comments on that? I apologize. I'm steamrolling through the agenda right now. <laughs> Comments? All right. Next, um, we have an issue. It looks like, I think it wasn't necessarily about the issue itself, Christoph, but you were talking more about communication changes and how, or excuse me, changes and how we communicate those changes and things like that. The issue itself was uh, about Blunderbuss. Uh, could we use GitHub reviewers instead of assignees? Um, and then your comment to contributor experience folks was, um, says makes you think about the idea of ownership of code process changes and uh, this is a piece where the process could be better um, and it was initiated from the test and testing infra um, so in yeah. our Twitter, I actually did lay out communication stuff did you see that or were you going to somewhere different with that no, that's exactly where I was going to. And the fact that we have so, it written down somewhere like, hey, this is what contributor experience is going to do when we, you know, look at rolling out these kind of changes, uh, especially, you know, as it, as, like, as the gray, there's a gray area in the middle between contributor experience and, and uh, SIG testing and test infra um, that we're all kind of on the same page about what, you know, if, because it's this started out as a hey we need to reinvent this munge github munger into a prow plugin but in in the midst of that there was a process like an outward facing process change to how the the plugin would function um and uh cole sent a message out to um uh kubernetes dev and there was nobody complained, nobody said anything. So I'm fine as far as like leaving it the way it is. And now, now we'll use GitHub reviews. Totally fine with that. But yeah, now, as, well, now that we have written down like what the expectation is as far as, hey, we're going to make a change. It's going to affect people. We're going to communicate it out. That's, that's all I was kind of looking for there. Okay, cool. Um... For those on the call, uh, the charter was checked in. Uh, we do have some things to add to it, uh, especially we want to talk a little bit about cap and, and et cetera. But um, for those that have not read it, what we are discussing is on the charter, um, there is now an outline of how we communicate these process changes. Um, it's on the agenda for a later item, but I'm just going to get to it right now that um, we're going to do lazy consensus with a time box of at least 72 hours to the following mailing lists. And that in that body is going to include a GitHub issue link and the subject will have a big notice on the subject and the mailing lists that would be affected would be Kubernetes dev, SIG leads, and the contributor experience mailing list all in one. And then we'll also announce the said change uh, at the weekly Kubernetes community meeting that happens on Thursday. Does anybody have any uh, other suggestions or ways that we should communicate better about process changes, especially org-wide? I think the community meeting is the best channel for that. So I like the idea of lazy consensus followed by verbal announcements and mailing lists. I think those are the two most looked at places. I don't have data to back that up. Um, yeah. And then Slack seems like a good, a good other option. Uh, but I don't know of one Slack channel that is going to is likely to reach everyone. Yeah, and we try. Well, we we tried to actually create an announcements channel where we lock it down to only certain people that were in it. But Slack 
guidelines say that that's the general channel and it looks like someone changed the general channel to the Kubernetes dev channel uh, and that has 5,000 plus people in it. So it would be difficult for us to switch those things out. Georgia, it looks like you want to say something. Yeah, it feels like we should just say and Slack for common courtesy because it's yeah. such an ephemeral. Yep. Slack for common courtesy. Slack for common courtesy. I like that. Hey, Paris, uh, yep. we skipped over one last thing in the automation side. Yeah, I know. I, I, I just went to that just because the issue was, um, just because the issue touched that. So we're going to, I'm going right back to it right now. Um, and then go ahead. Did you want to talk about that actually, Garrett, while I... I did. I was kind of hoping Aaron was on the call because I think he was the one championing getting rid of right access to a lot of the repos. Uh, and I, I, I know he had an umbrella issue somewhere of all the tasks needed in order to remove uh, right access and I think maybe the, the project managers teams or one of those teams that we had specifically because we couldn't do everything with automation and I think the last thing that we needed to get done was the ability to set the milestone for a group for SIG leads and milestone maintainers within the project and uh, last week I wrote a plugin that uh, accepts the command forward slash milestone so you can say forward slash milestone v110 or v19 uh, or forward slash milestone clear uh, set or remove milestones from issues and PRs. Uh, huge thanks to Test Infra, the CJ, um, or sorry, Cole and Steve helped out a ton with this. But I believe that we no longer need the milestone maintainers team. I wanted to verify with Aaron if that's true. Um, so I'll reach out to milestone maintainers GitHub team or yes yeah so there were teams sorry not the milestone maintainers github team i apologize uh, i mean the project managers team there was a specific team we created to grant right access because people didn't have all of the uh capabilities that they needed from the cloud plugins and i think this yeah is i think i think you're right i'm trying to find aaron's umbrella issue but i believe you are correct that the last thing that the pm team needed was the milestone command. Um, there were still a couple use cases for the maintainers team, in particular, like editing GitHub PR bodies. Uh, actually, um, and the milestone, the, the plugin uses the maintainers team, so we definitely need the maintainers team. <laughs> no, I mean the, the Kubernetes dash maintainers for oh, direct write access. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, there, was, there were a couple use cases that the Kubernetes dash maintainers team still needed addressed, but the Kubernetes dash PM team, I think the last one was the, uh, yeah, the milestone command. But I'm trying to dig through and find where Aaron's um, umbrella is. Awesome. Any other questions, concerns, comments about any of the automation stuff that we just discussed? There's also um, one thing, uh, another bullet on the agenda that I don't necessarily want to spend too, too much time on, um, but that's the revival of a four new contributors label or some other wording variety. I mean, just insert like good first issue, which is already the, a GitHub standard, uh, you know, something along the lines of, um, letting other contributors who have uh, either a never contributed before or maybe you know uh, less than one year of experience or something along those lines uh, right now the uh, the issues that are coming in from contributors or that the help wanted label uh, isn't is uh, complex in the fact that it looks like it's for very uh, very experienced either developers and or contributors. Um, and that it's not very friendly to the folks that I just mentioned. Um, what we need to do here is file an issue, obviously. We also need to come up with the naming convention um, and also include uh, the remove piece as well in there. Um, and then also the one of the most important pieces to this is education around how to use this to the broader community and that it's available uh, and that they should be using it. Uh, when they can. Uh, I know some of the other groups are starting to use good first issue since it is the the, uh, the GitHub standard in there. 
So I don't know if anybody wants to take this, but this is uh, an opportunity to help out uh, in this area. Uh, the need is on the agenda uh, if you'd like to jump in. Um, the, the other thing that I would, if I can just jump in there for a quick sec, Paris, the thing that I would want to add to that is the, the meatier part of that issue, I would say, is the proposal and the process around like when things should apply and how good first issue and help wanted would work together. So like kind of designing how it should work and what, how we want it to work. The bot pieces and the automation pieces there are super simple. Um, and, and I, you know, I can definitely volunteer to help out if somebody is like scared of the bot end of things and, and how things are done on the prow side. The bigger, the bigger thing there would be figuring out like how we want this to work, both for contributors searching for the label as well as, um, contributors who are adding the label and removing the label from issues. Also, where do we communicate to people adding the label? That that's what they should do. Like, where is a good place for that? Is it? It's not really the contributor. Is it? You know, should we put it in the template for issues? Um, yeah. I mean, that's. I think we should definitely follow the communication guidelines that we mentioned earlier. If we do roll this out and ask people for feedback, which is Kubernetes Dev, Sig Leads, Contributor Experience, Mailing List. Uh, and then also check in with SIGs on a regular basis. Um, but to your point, I mean, we probably should have some kind of doc for SIG leads in general that tells, or just SIGs in general that tells them about the, uh, what the help wanted means and things like that. Yeah, but if I'm just running in somewhere and I'm a new contributor, but really I'm just filing an issue, or, ah, well, I mean, maybe then I wouldn't add the help wanted label, but let's see. I don't know, if I'm not a SIG lead, how do I know when to, and how to add the help wanted label and or versus the good first issue label? Like, you know, how do I find that out? Just filing an issue. Anyone have anything to comment on that? I don't have a good answer. Um, um, I know real Brian, good. it's... Sorry, go ahead, um, Garrett. Yeah, this is Chris, but that's all right. Um, Sorry, Chris. A real good way is just to ask in the uh, dev development channel specifically for the SIG um, that owns the source code, or like for instance, um, uh, with kubeadm, you'd ask in SIG cluster lifecycle, hey, is this a good issue? Should I tag it? And there'll be more you know, developers around that should be able to answer that question. Um, that's usually but, how I've seen it addressed. But that relies on tribal knowledge. I don't know if, you, uh, so your question then is how do we teach people on how to identify um, issues that are good for uh, new contributors? Is that what you're asking? Um, well, I mean, I, not necessarily teaching. Um, I, I just like to have a doc somewhere that says something like this, roughly, is a good help wanted. Something like this is a good first contributor issue. Um, if there's any debate or doubt in your mind, of course, then the default is go ask someone who might decide, who might know better than you. That's fine. But I do want there to be a, like this, a bucket for each, right? And I want it to be available to someone who's just filing an issue. Um, because I don't really want to necessarily ask a SIG lead every time I'm filing a documentation issue against the contributor guide, right? I'm just like, well, I want someone to fix my links. That's kind of a good first person. I, you know, I don't know. Um, but I want to, I want there to be a place perhaps in each SIG, like it should somehow, it feels like it's a contributing issue, right? It feels like there should be a way to just write that down so you don't have to ask every single time. Would that be like, um, in a developer guide where, uh, you know, like Christoph linked, uh, in the chat where the help wanted explanation is? Um, maybe something like that. Um, I don't know. I'm racking my brain here trying to think. 
Uh, yeah, and I mean, yeah. yes, and I guess my question is like, where would be a logical place to put that where people will find it? Because this is something that's really only relevant for people who've been in the code base for a while, yeah. but aren't necessarily SIG leads and might not really necessarily look for that. Or if they do look for it, how can we make it that they can find it easily? This might be a good thing to road show when people are going to road show to SIGs to tell them about. Yeah, and it's on. I mean, that it's this. I mean, four new contributors isn't necessarily on there, but during the road show, we do have. We are talking about labels and label descriptions and things like that. So it's definitely on the menu. All right. By the way, my my two cents, and I, I get what you're saying. That's a very complex question. Like, I'm not sure how to teach people how to just figure out that something simple. You know, unless it's like, you know, this is not documented well inside the source code or a broken link, you know, but I don't, as, as a brand new contributor, I don't know if I want to give them that. We got to give them something that's fun. I don't know. That's, that was a great question. Really complex. <laughs> All right. We've got it's like two minutes, not even left. And there is one more item and I, I don't. I don't necessarily have all the answers to this one right now either, but uh, we are changing leadership roles within this SIG. Um, the new governance template has come out and been merged from the steering committee. Um, this would be effectively changing uh, our titles to chair, as well as adding uh, technical leads uh, and sub-project owners. Uh, that would be uh, based off of the projects.md file that uh, I'm in the middle of checking in right now, those project.md headers, things like, uh, uh, I keep saying candidate, but contributor documentation is one, contributor automation and workflow is another, mentoring is another. Those are all sub-projects that have owner's files. Um, if you're following along with the owner's file changes uh, or progression of changes, you'll, you know, see this kind of coming as far as like everything being now needed to um, tie to owner's files. Um, so check the mailing list for uh, all of the updates as far as the, this leadership uh, is concerned. But each one of you that are currently owning uh, one of those sub projects that I mentioned will be listed as a sub project owner, uh, and then uh, all of uh, all of the other folks are still members. Um, so that's the organizational change that I just wanted to announce before we blasted that on the mailing list. So, cool questions, concerns, comments from everyone before we wrap. Right. I'll just throw in real quick. I found yeah. that SaaS service that does license checking, and I threw it in with links and some pictures and other stuff in there. So awesome. you want to start looking at it. Yeah, Garrett will be ever so grateful. So thanks for that, Matt. All right. We've got a lot of work to do, folks. We will see you next week uh, when Gwen's talking this week at scale, y'all, if y'all are going to scale. <laughs> are, are, are you both going to scale? I am going to scale, yeah. You will have a great time. I'm going to have people come find you. You will have yeah. such a great time. Such a great so time. excited. So yeah. excited. Yeah. 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 Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it, especially walking us through the cap stuff. Uh, it's foreign to me, so I really appreciate your guidance. I think he's frozen. Yes. Or he's <laughs> smiling. He's frozen wow. on a really good face where he's like smiling. smiling. <laughs> Quick, save, save it. Quick. Okay, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, you and I have a call soon, Paris. Yeah. Okay. I will All see right. you then. Okay. Right, I'll talk to you. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Yeah.